The RRSP, or Registered Retirement Savings Plan, is a special type of account in Canada that gets special tax treatment from the Canada Revenue Agency. It is only an account. The RRSP itself is not an investment. For any of my US audience, the RRSP is similar in many ways to the traditional IRA. The RRSP was first introduced in 1957, at a time when defined benefit pension plans were still common. Since then, defined benefit pensions have mostly disappeared, and Canadians are largely on their own to save for retirement. The RRSP is one of the most helpful retirement planning tools that we have available to us for two main reasons. It allows us to defer income tax to a future year, and it allows our investments to grow tax-free. I'm Ben Felix, Associate Portfolio Manager at PWL Capital. In this episode of Common Sense Investing, I'm going to tell you everything that you need to know about the RRSP. There's a lot to cover on this topic, so I'm going to try and break it up into a few sections that I think make logical sense. First, I'm going to tell you how the RRSP works. Then I'm going to tell you the most common misconceptions that I see when it comes to the RRSP. And finally, I'm going to tell you how to think about the RRSP in the context of your investment portfolio. Each year that you have earned income, you get 18% of the amount that you earned added to your RRSP limit for the following calendar year. Earned income is a bit of a broad definition. The most common sources of earned income are T4 employment income, which you would have as an employee, net self-employment income, or net rental income. For example, if you made $100,000 in 2018, your new RRSP room in 2019 would be $18,000. There is an annual maximum for new room. In 2019, the maximum is 26,500, which means that if you earned more than $147,222 in 2018, you would not get additional RRSP room on the additional income. Everyone gets $2,000 of over contribution room on top of whatever their limit is. Any excess contributions though, cannot be deducted from your taxable income. If you pay into a pension plan or deferred profit sharing plan, then your RRSP room will be reduced based on those contributions. Once you have contribution room, you are able to make a contribution. Here is where the RRSP starts to get interesting. Every dollar that you contribute to the RRSP within your deduction limit can be deducted from your taxable income in that year or in a future year. That last bit is really important. You do not have to deduct the full amount of your contribution in the year that you contribute. Can you guess why you might not deduct all of your contributions in a given year? You might consider deferring some or all of your deductions if you expect to have more income in higher tax brackets the following year. In order to deduct your RRSP contribution from your income in a given year, the contribution has to be made within the first 60 days of the following calendar year. For example, if you want to use your deduction for the 2018 tax year, then your contribution has to be in your RRSP account by March 1st, 2019. The RRSP is referred to as a tax deferred account. You defer income tax by using your RRSP deduction to lower your taxable income. When you eventually withdraw from the account, the withdrawals are included in your taxable income at that time. At age 71, the RRSP has to convert to a RIF, which has a minimum annual withdrawal. In other words, at some point in the future, you are required to start making taxable withdrawals from the account. There are a couple of cases where money can be taken out of the RRSP without incurring an immediate tax liability. The home buyer's plan allows for a first time home buyer to withdraw up to $25,000. You are considered a first time home buyer if you did not occupy a home that you or your current spouse or common law partner owned within the four year period, beginning on January 1st of the year that you will withdraw funds from the RRSP. When you make a home buyer's plan withdrawal, you have to pay it all back into your RRSP over 15 years, starting in the second year after the year of the withdrawal. If you miss a repayment, it is treated as if you withdrew that amount as taxable income. It's kind of like a loan to yourself where you're borrowing out of your RRSP. The lifelong learning plan shares similar properties to the home buyer's plan, except that the amount is $10,000 per year up to $20,000 total, and the purpose is for covering education costs and the repayment period is 10 years as opposed to 15. While these programs are helpful in certain situations, I would avoid using them if possible. This is because one of the biggest benefits of the RRSP is that it allows your investments to grow tax-free. 
Borrowing money from the account reduces the amount of time that your investments can grow tax-free. With that said, if you need to buy a home ASAP and the alternatives are not making an RSP contribution and spending $25,000 on a home, or putting the money into the RSP for 90 days and then using the home buyer's plan, I'd probably go with the RSP contribution, especially if you're in a high tax bracket. Ideally, though, you will max out your RSP, leave the money in there, and save up elsewhere for a house. All right, that was a general overview of how the RRSP works. Now I'm going to tell you some of the most common misconceptions that I hear about this type of account. Lots of people seem to think that there are penalties or restrictions for withdrawing from an RRSP early. That is not true. There are no explicit age restrictions or penalties for withdrawing from the RRSP before retirement. You can make a withdrawal any time. When you make a withdrawal, the financial institution is required to withhold tax. The amount of withholding tax depends on the amount of the withdrawal, but it is never more than 30%, except in Quebec where it's 31%. When you file your tax return in the year of the withdrawal, you will either pay or receive the difference between the withholding tax rate and your actual tax rate. The withholding tax is not a penalty. Remember that you deferred tax when you used your RRSP deduction, so you have to pay tax when you make a withdrawal. I said that there is no explicit penalty for an early withdrawal which is true, but there is an implicit penalty. When you make an RSP withdrawal, that room is gone. This means that you used your contribution room when you made a contribution, but unlike the TFSA, you will never get the room back after making a withdrawal. The loss of RRSP room due to an early withdrawal is not good for your long-term financial health. The RRSP itself is not an investment. I often hear people say that they want to buy more RRSPs, or that the RRSP is not a good investment. That is not how this works. The RRSP is just a type of account. Inside of that account, you can hold cash, buy stocks, bonds, GICs, or other qualified investments. Unless you're using the RRSP to buy a house or to fund your education in the near future using the Home Buyers Plan or the Lifelong Learning Plan, the RRSP is best used to hold long-term investments like stock and bond ETFs. Sometimes I hear that the RRSP converts dividends and capital gains to income, making it a tax-inefficient account. False. It only looks this way if you ignore the initial tax deduction. There are two components of tax savings at work here. The income tax deferral and the tax-free investment growth. Tax-free. Let's think about how the RRSP works. When you earn a dollar of income, it can go straight into your RRSP without any taxes due to the deduction. Alternatively, you could invest this money in the TFSA, but you would have to pay some tax on it first. Let's assume a 30% tax rate. So you start with $1 in the RRSP or 70 cents in the TFSA. Fast forward 20 years, assuming that both the RRSP and the TFSA earned 5% per year, the dollar in the RRSP is now worth $2.65, while the 70 cents in the TFSA is now worth $1.86. But to spend the money in the RRSP, we need to pay tax. If we assume the same 30% tax rate that we had at the beginning, the RRSP ends up being the exact same as the TFSA, $1.86. They both grew tax-free. When people think about the RRSP as being a bad deal due to all of the taxes that they have to pay, they are ignoring the initial tax savings. We just assumed the same 30% tax rate at the beginning and end of our example. If the tax rate were lower at the end, the RRSP would have looked much better than the TFSA after tax. If the tax rate had been higher, the TFSA would have looked better. For most people, their taxable income in their working and saving years will be higher than their taxable income in retirement. This is a really important point for anyone trying to decide whether they should use their RRSP or their TFSA. If you are in a high tax bracket, relative to the tax bracket you expect to be in when you withdraw from your RRSP, then the RRSP has a good chance of giving you a better after-tax result than the TFSA. Finally, tangent to what I was just talking about, I find that people with pensions will often avoid the RRSP altogether. Remember, all you have to do is be in a lower tax rate when you withdraw than when you contribute. If you have a pension, you will typically not get more than 70% of your working income as a pension benefit. 
This means that you are likely to be in a lower tax bracket in the future compared to when you are working, especially if you have a spouse with a lower income to split your pension income with. The one case where this might not hold true is if your pension income after splitting is high enough to push you into OAS clawback, which effectively increases your tax rate by 15%. I mentioned briefly that you probably want to be investing the cash that you put into your RRSP. That is the second major benefit, tax-free growth. When you get to that point, there are some important things to keep in mind. As always, investing in low-cost total market index funds is probably the most sensible approach for any long-term investor. This is as true in the RRSP as it is in any other account. In terms of asset allocation, anything that goes into your RRSP needs to be reduced by your expected future tax rate to achieve your desired asset allocation. I went into far more detail in my video on this topic, but here's a quick example. If you had $50,000 of bonds in an RRSP and $50,000 of stocks in a TFSA, your pre-tax asset allocation is 50% stocks and 50% bonds. But your after-tax asset allocation is what matters. At a 30% tax rate, your after-tax asset allocation is closer to 60% stocks and 40% bonds. In the end, it is only your after-tax asset allocation that matters. So this should be considered when you're deciding on portfolio allocations. This pre versus after-tax asset allocation issue only arises when you're holding different proportions of asset classes in your various account types. If you're using an asset allocation ETF like VGRO or XGRO in your RRSP, then you do not have to worry about this because every asset class is reduced proportionally by taxes, keeping your pre and after tax asset allocations the same. If you are managing a portfolio of ETFs or stocks, you may consider holding your US listed equities inside of your RRSP as opposed to your TFSA. This is because US stocks and ETFs are not required to withhold tax on dividends paid to an RRSP account. This means that both a US stock and a US listed ETF of US stocks can be held in an RRSP account while avoiding the 15% withholding tax that would otherwise be levied if the asset were held in a TFSA. Ideally, you will avoid holding a Canadian listed ETF that owns a US listed ETF of international or emerging market stocks in your RRSP. If you do this, you will lose two levels of withholding tax, one from the US and one from the international countries. The same is true for the TFSA. Similar to what I described in my video on the TFSA, I would avoid holding individual stocks in the RRSP. Risking your valuable RRSP room for a bet that is unlikely to pay off does not seem sensible. If you want to know how unlikely that bet is to pay off, check out my video on picking stocks. This video was meant to be a primer on the RRSP, how it works, mistakes to avoid, and some tips when it comes to investing. I hope it was helpful. Did I miss any misconceptions or tips that people should know about? Tell me about them in the comments. Thanks for watching. My name is Ben Felix of PWL Capital and this is Common Sense Investing. I will be talking about a new Common Sense Investing topic every two weeks, so subscribe, click the bell for updates. If you enjoy my Common Sense Investing video series, don't forget to check out the Rational Reminder podcast, which is available on all of the podcast platforms.